What you are watching, with demonstrators tightly packed, linking arms together, marching in a zigzag formation, has been described by Western observers as the snake dance. It was first pioneered by a group of radical students in Japan known as the Zenkakuren, and when it was televised around the world during the immediate post-war years, it impressed leftists throughout the West to the point that, in 1968, American protesters even tried to imitate the snake dance during the historic anti-Vietnam War demonstrations outside the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. It may come as a shock for those who think of modern Japan as a bastion of capitalism, but it was innovations like the snake dance that once placed Japanese socialists and communists on the cutting edge of leftist movements around the globe. Those more familiar with Japan's post-war history might not be surprised, because, after all, in 1960, Japan almost underwent a full-blown revolution spearheaded by its left. In the year of 1960, a massive protest movement erupted in Japan against the right-wing government's plan to revise a security treaty that would allow the United States to maintain military bases across the country. Known as the Anpo Struggle, led primarily by socialists, communists, and labor unions, an estimated 30 million Japanese citizens participated in protests of some kind between March 1959 to June 1960. In a country of about 90 million at the time, one third of Japan's entire population came out to the streets to protest the security treaty. And at its peak of the protests on June 15, 1960, the Japanese left also succeeded in mobilizing 6.4 million workers in a nationwide general strike. To put those numbers into context, the largest protest movement in US history was during the 2020 George Floyd Black Lives Matter demonstrations, when an estimated 15 to 26 million people took to the streets at some point, with the exact numbers vary based on different studies by polling agencies. When it comes to labor uprisings, the US has never had a nationwide general strike, and the the largest strike wave in its history was in 1945 and 1946 involving 5 million workers. In other words, the much smaller country of Japan, with just a third of the US population, saw a larger protest movement and labor action than anything ever experienced in American history. While there were many socialist movements throughout Japan during the immediate post-war years, it was during the 1960 Anpo struggle that the nation came very close to experiencing a revolution. As Maruyama Masao, a leading political theorist and historian at the time, who also participated in the Anpo struggle, stated, Never before in Japan's history have the masses, in the face of abuse of power by the government, organized so spontaneously without reference to their own personal interests, to protest on such a large scale and for so many consecutive days. In that sense, this was a revolutionary event in Japan's history. But the 1960 Anpo struggle, once seen as an inspiration across the globe, has now become forgotten history in the West as well as within much of Japan. Japanese history textbooks, for example, completely gloss over the protests against the US-Japan Security Treaty. The youth in the country today, unlike the generation from the 1950s and 60s, are more passive and apathetic about politics. And despite the continuing widespread public disapproval of the ruling Liberal Democratic Party, the dominant right-wing establishment has had a solid grip on power in Japan for half a century. So what exactly happened to the Japanese left? How did Japan go from the verge of a socialist revolution in the 1960s to a capitalist state now firmly under a right-wing regime? Our story begins right after the end of the Second World War. The defeat of fascism was such a transformative event in Japan's history that Maruyama Masao called the country's surrender the August Revolution akin to the French Revolution that led to the killing of a king. While Japan's emperor was not executed by the US, his relegation from the status of a deity to a mere symbol of the state can be described as a sort of regicidal revolution. With the defeat in the war and the subsequent transformation of the country, Japanese leftists who had either been incarcerated or in hiding during the rule of fascism were able to make a comeback and re-enter government. In the 1947 general election, a member of the Socialist Party was elected prime minister. In the 1949 election, the Japanese Communist Party won 35 seats in Japan's diet the national legislature. Even Nosaka Sanzo, the Japanese communist leader who spent the war years fighting with the Chinese against his own country, was able to win a seat in the Diet. But as the Cold War began heating up, these gains by Japanese socialists and communists gave American officials cause for alarm. 
Since the U.S. still occupied Japan and were the de facto rulers of the country until 1952, they were in a convenient position to counteract the trends happening under their very noses. In what historians call a reverse course policy, the U.S. released various fascist leaders who had been imprisoned right after the war, allowing them to re-enter government in order to counter the advances made by the left. One such fascist was Kishi Nobusuke, who served as a cabinet minister in Tojo's wartime government. Despite his detention for war crimes, Kishi was set free in 1948 as part of the reverse course policy. Less than 10 years later, in 1957, he became prime minister. His grandson, Abe Shinzo, would do the same half a century later. In tandem with the return of fascist leaders to the Japanese government, tens of thousands of communists and suspected communists were fired from various public and private positions within the US-backed red purges of the late 1940s and early 50s. As a result, Japanese leftists went underground to stage a Maoist-style guerrilla military campaign in an attempt to overthrow the government. But this strategy of armed struggle completely backfired. It turned disastrous for the Japanese Communist Party, which lost legitimacy in the eyes of the Japanese public, losing all of its 35 seats in the National Diet in the 1952 general election. At that point, it seemed that the US policies of reverse course and red purges had succeeded in containing the left and preventing it from ever taking power in Japan. Nevertheless, the US was determined to remain vigilant. Even after the official US occupation ended, the CIA continued to actively advise and encourage Japan's two right-wing parties to unite as one in order to prevent the socialists from ever winning again. In 1955, under CIA orchestration, the liberals and the democrats merged to form the Liberal Democratic Party, which has gone on to dominate Japanese politics to the present day. But in the very same year, just as the US and the right wing thought they had consolidated power, the Japanese left would make another big comeback. In the town of Sunagawa, southwest of Tokyo, a large grassroots protest movement erupted against the planned expansion of a US military base. Although similar anti-base demonstrations had occurred across Japan since 1952, the Sunagawa struggle became the biggest of such protests. It also marked a key turning point in terms of tactics utilized by the left. Instead of underground armed struggles such as those which had proved so unpopular with the Japanese public during the late 1940s and early 50s, the communist student organizers in Sunagawa, the Zenkakuren, shifted to the use of non-violent civil disobedience such as sit-ins. This new Gandhian style strategy worked. Images and reports of young, unarmed students being beaten with police batons elicited sympathy from the wider Japanese public. Two years into the struggle, by 1957, the protesters had won and the government was forced to shut down the expansion of the military base. With the US military still stationing over 200,000 troops on 1,352 square kilometers of land, an area almost twice the size of New York City, in the densely populated country of Japan, there were many Japanese predisposed to the sympathies with the motivations of the student protesters. With the Sunagawa struggle, the entire anti-base movement picked up momentum. Adding fuel to the discontent, the right-wing Liberal Democratic Party began taking steps to revise Japan's post-war pacifist constitution. In a country still traumatized by the Second World War, the attempt by the ruling party to remilitarize Japan pushed more citizens to demonstrate against the government. These anti-military sentiments would reach their peak in the late 1950s, setting the stage for what became known as the Anpo Struggle of 1960. In 1957, when former fascist wartime leader Kishi Nobusuke came to power as prime minister, he convinced the United States to work on a revision of the security treaty, known as the Nichibe Anzen Hosho Joyaku, or ANPO in its contracted form. Prime Minister Kishi thought the new security treaty would be popular, as it would include an obligation by the US to defend Japan if it were ever attacked. But Kishi seriously underestimated the dissatisfaction with the other provisions of the newly proposed treaty, which would not only allow US military bases to remain in the country, but would also give US troops the special right to quell any civil disturbances in Japan, i.e. allowing the US unilaterally to use force against any domestic insurgency. 
Kishi's plan to suppress the momentum of the left after the Sunagawa struggle completely backfired and only helped unite the opposition against the pending US-Japan Security Treaty revision. In 1959, a number of left-wing and center-left groups joined together under one umbrella organization called the Kokomin Kaigi. This united front included labor groups such as the Sohyo, which could crucially mobilize millions into the streets and organize strikes. But the Kokumin Kaigi also comprised more radical student groups who were more willing to take dramatic direct action and clash with the police. The umbrella organization even included some conservative-leaning business groups as well. And while the Japanese Communist Party had only observer status within the Kokumin Kaigi, their participation in the popular cause, as well as ditching their earlier engagements with militant activities, helped them regain legitimacy with the public. During the two years of the Anpo struggle from 1959 to 1960, membership of the Japanese Communist Party doubled from 40,000 to 80,000. While these groups were united during the Anpo struggle, they still held different motivations and followed different tactics in their shared opposition to the revised security treaty. For the more moderate and liberal groups of the Kokumin Kaigi, the Anpo struggle was about protecting Japanese democracy. For them, Prime Minister Kishi was a wartime fascist leader trying to overturn Japan's pacifist constitution. His efforts to ratify a widely unpopular treaty was also seen as undemocratic. For the Japanese Communist Party, on the other hand, the protests were ultimately about fighting back against American imperialism best exemplified by the encouragement of its members to hold demonstrations outside of the U.S. Embassy. For the more radical students in the Zenkakuren, which also had to contend with its own internal factions, the Anpo struggle was not about quote-unquote protecting Japanese democracy, it was more about toppling capitalism as a whole. And unlike the Japanese Communist Party, which often advocated against it, the Zenkakuren aggressively focused on direct actions against the Japanese government. It was thus this mixed amalgamation of student radicals who undertook the most drastic efforts against the security treaty. On November 27, 1959, 12,000 demonstrators led by the Zenkakuren raided and occupied the compound of the Japanese Diet. On January 15, 1960, the night before Kishi was set to travel to the United States, about 700 Zenkakuren radicals occupied Haneda Airport in Tokyo, creating a human barricade in order to prevent the Prime Minister from leaving for the US to sign the new treaty. And on April 26, 1960, before the treaty was ratified, the Zenkakuren also organized strikes at 20 universities across the country. On the same day, as nationwide student boycotts were underway, the Zenkakuren once again attempted to raid the Diet. While the more moderate factions within the Kokumin Kaigi, along with the Japanese Communist Party and Socialist Party, initially condemned these more aggressive tactics of the Zenkakuren, they too were eventually compelled to adopt extreme measures to prevent the ratification of the security treaty. On May 19th, Prime Minister Kishi suddenly called for extension of the regular diet session in an attempt to fast-track the passage of the treaty in the lower house. The opposition parties, led by the socialist diet members, held a sit-in to prevent a call for a vote by physically blocking the hallways. At 11 p.m., the Liberal Democratic Party members brought in police officers to forcefully remove the socialist diet members. At the stroke of midnight on May 20th, a half-empty diet chamber with only the Liberal Democratic Party members in attendance voted to pass the treaty, paving the way for an automatic ratification on June 19th. Kishi may have succeeded in circumventing the socialists, but the broadcast images of elected representatives being physically removed from the legislature had a powerful effect on the Japanese public who, now more than ever, saw the security treaty as a direct assault on democracy. With socialist legislators taking action, the Japanese Communist Party also stepped up in dramatic fashion in their continuing fight against American imperialism. On June 10th, just over a week before the automatic ratification and a month before a planned visit to Japan by President Eisenhower to celebrate the event, Presidential Press Secretary James Haggerty arrived at Haneda Airport, where he was met by Ambassador Douglas MacArthur II. But as their motorcade left the airport, they were blocked by a group of 6,000 communist demonstrators. Haggerty and MacArthur had to be airlifted out by a U.S. Marine helicopter. This was a huge international embarrassment for Eisenhower, who was then forced to cancel his trip to Japan. The Anpo struggle reached its peak on June 15th, 
three days before the security treaty was to be ratified, with a series of coordinated protests. The labor unions in the Kokumin Kaigi mobilized 6.4 million workers in a general strike, and an estimated 30,000 shops closed down for the day in a show of solidarity. The Zenkakuren, for their part, made one last attempt to raid the Diet, but this time, Unlike the November 1959 raid, they were met with better prepared and well armed security forces who countered the protesters with tear gas and water cannons. In one wild skirmish with the Zenkakuren, a young woman named Kamba Michiko was crushed to death by the riot police, and she became a martyr for the movement. A few days later, in one final protest, 300,000 demonstrators surrounded the Diet. It was an impressive effort, but to no avail. The security treaty was finally ratified in the upper house as scheduled, and the Anpo struggle came to a close. Although the Anpo struggle failed in its main goal of stopping the security treaty, it did lead to some positive results for the left. Kishinobusuke may have succeeded in passing his renewed security treaty, but a month after the ratification of the treaty, he was forced to resign from office in disgrace. Furthermore, his successor from the Liberal Democratic Party, Ikeda Hayato, had been chastened by the strength and popularity of the left and knew full well that any attempt to revise Japan's pacifist constitution or to remilitarize the country would be met with strong resistance, and so the measure was shelved. These were the victories that the left could claim. The Socialist Party leader, Eda Saburo, has described the time as a new dawn for Japan, with the conservative camp having been dealt a huge blow by the Anpo struggle. It must be said, however, that the Liberal Democratic Party, despite its resolute commitment to right-wing policies, demonstrated a great deal of political acumen in adopting some of the demands of the left. When Ikeda came to power, he introduced an income doubling plan by expanding Japan's social safety net. Ikeda also succeeded in convincing the United States, now under the leadership of President Kennedy, for a more generous trade agreement that further boosted Japan's economy. And even years later, after the 1972 election for instance, when the Japanese Communist Party reached an under peak by winning 38 seats in the National Diet, the Liberal Democratic Party announced that 1973 as the dawn of a new era, calling it Year One of Welfare, with the promise of expanding benefits for the retired and disabled. In effect, they were chipping away at the base of popular support for the left. While Prime Minister Kishinobusuke had shown himself to be more hardline and reactionary, the Liberal Democrats like Ikeda and those who came after him adopted more flexible positions towards certain progressive policies. These concessions helped them contain the growing influence of left-wing opposition parties. But it wasn't just the political savviness of the Liberal Democratic Party in adopting some progressive reforms that kept the left from going further after Anpo. There were also crucial mistakes made by the left itself which placed out of reach their dreams of a full-scale revolution in Japan. As one of the leading socialist organizers at the time of Anpo, Ota Kaoru recalls, At the climax of the Anpo struggle, of course we, the leaders of Sohyo, but no less the socialist and communist parties, frankly speaking, failed to exercise leadership. We lost control. Various people are saying that they took the lead. But the truth is, it was actually a spontaneous rising of the masses, the climax of an awe-inspiring mass movement. If the Anpo struggle had been gradually built up over time, over the course of a larger number of well-organized protests, it would not have suddenly receded like that, and it would have been possible to keep the struggle going to some extent. The key reason why the Japanese left failed to bring about a real revolution was the lack of coherent leadership and unified vision. Even if they temporarily managed to unite under the Kokumin Kaigi, there were unresolved, fundamental divisions. The Socialist and Japanese Communist Party wanted a quote-unquote peaceful revolution. Their party platform moved closer to democratic socialism and further away from Marxist-Leninism, with an emphasis on protecting Japan's pacifist constitution. They focused their attention on electoral politics after Anpo, but when they did demonstrate, these parties remained disciplined and utilized only non-violent tactics. 
The Zenkakuren, on the other hand, aspired to be more like the Bolsheviks during the Russian Revolution and act as sort of a quote-unquote vanguard party. As such, they continued using more violent tactics such as throwing stones or Molotov cocktails or clashing with the police using wooden clubs. Although there was still a minority faction within the Zenkakuren that stayed loyal to the Japanese Communist Party, the mainstream of the student radicals viewed the party with deep disdain, lambasting them as counter-revolutionary and not being true communists. The Zenkakuren would deploy their militant activities to protest other causes. Notable incidents include demonstrations against the Vietnam War in October and November 1967, when they would once again occupy Haneda Airport in order to prevent the Prime Minister from visiting Saigon and the US. There were also occupations of universities led by the offshoot of the Zenkakuren, called the Zenkyoto, which at its peak in the late 1960s, conducted massive demonstrations on 80% of the nation's campuses, 165 schools in total. The Zenkakuren would also take part in what was called the Sanli Zuka struggle, in which they fought back against riot police with homemade battering rams in their protests against the construction of Narita Airport, which threatened to displace local farmers. But while we can admire their courage, it is hard to say that the Zenkakuren succeeded. They didn't stop the Prime Minister from leaving Haneda Airport. Narita Airport ended up being completed, and today, Almost all universities in Japan have a total ban on political activities on their campuses, where even distributing leaflets is strictly prohibited. University students during the late 1960s overwhelmingly supported left opposition parties, but the most recent polls from Japan showed that the youth today, those in their 20s and early 30s, are more likely to vote for the conservative Liberal Democratic Party than their older peers. The Zenkakuren tried to be a vanguard party, but they ultimately failed because no one else followed. They acted alone and didn't really try to broaden their appeal to the masses. Furthermore, it seems that the Zenkakure in the late 1960s may have forgotten the lessons from the pre-Anpo years of the late 1940s and 50s. Namely, that the previous use of violence by the left, such as when it tried to stage an underground Mao-style uprising, completely failed to win over public opinion. They forgot that they had been more successful with Gandhian-style non-violence during the Sunagawa struggle, when they not only won over public sympathy and support, but also succeeded in the goal of stopping the expansion of a military base. If there is a lesson in all of this, it is that the left needs to stay united. The reason why the Anpo struggle was the closest Japan came to a socialist revolution was because there were many factions coming together for a common cause. The unions organized strikes, the socialist and communist party parliamentary members fought within the halls of the diet, and the Zenkakuren conducted the radical direct actions needed to create a spectacle. There was a diversity of tactics in Anpo and neither the Japanese Communist Party nor the Zenkakuren can now organize a revolution on its own. Nevertheless, the specter of Anpo still haunts Japan. As the once thriving Japanese economy now starts to stagnate, there is still a chance that, in the near future, the Japanese left might make another big comeback. Especially as the Liberal Democratic Party seems to be channeling more hardline leaders from its past, men like Kishi Nobusuke, whose grandson Abe Shinzo, was a vocal advocate for revising Japan's pacifist constitution and remilitarizing the country. Japan's most recent outgoing Prime Minister from the Liberal Democrats recently left office with some of the lowest approval ratings in decades. And it must be noted that the Japanese do not lack the spirit of rebellion. From the Buddhist-led Kagaiki Rebellion in the 15th century, the Christian-led Shimabara Rebellion in the 17th century, as well as several Ainu rebellions in the northern region of Hokkaido, Japan history has shown that its people are willing to rise up to bring power to the people. It is not destined to forever be an orderly and passive capitalistic society. As the Anpo struggle has demonstrated, the Japanese are in fact capable of revolution.